In today's study, we're going to be going over the similarities between the Old Testament Joshua and that of Jesus. Now, just in case you're one of the naysayers that says, well, you're connecting dots that really shouldn't be connected, I would like for you all to examine what's said early on in the book of Joshua. After crossing the Jordan, Joshua encountered a strange man with a sword in his hand. And Joshua went unto him and said unto him, Art thou for us or for our adversaries? It's then that this strange man, he says, Nay, but as captain of the host of the Lord am I now come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and did worship and said unto him, What saith my Lord unto his servant? Now apparently it wasn't just normal speech that this man with the sword used to speak to Joshua because at first glimpse Joshua is not fearful. Suddenly he's spoken to by this man and he immediately falls to his face. He doesn't say, well, you know, you're not really captain of the Lord. So, so apparently this man spoke in a way that incited great fear within Joshua. I'm guessing it was quite loud. So immediately Joshua falls on his face and he says, well, Lord, what would you have me to do? And the captain of the Lord's host said unto Joshua, loose thy shoe from off thy foot for the place whereon thou standest is holy. And Joshua did so. And the Lord said unto Joshua, See, I have given into thine hand Jericho, and the king thereof, and the mighty men of valor. We see in this something very obvious to us Christians, and that's the pre-incarnate Christ, meaning this was the word of God, the Logos, appearing before he ever took upon himself human flesh. As the pre-incarnate Christ appeared to Moses and was worshipped by Moses before his mission began, so did he appear to Joshua and was worshipped by Joshua before his mission began. Now, if you know anything about ordinary angels within the Old Testament or the New, none of them receive worship. They don't allow men to bow down to them. They say, no, 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 we're not worthy of that. But Jesus, he's the only man in the whole Bible that actually does receive worship. He never does rebuke men for doing such. I believe Joshua is one of the greatest types of Christ. And this foreshadowing of the Lord and the events that would play out in his life, these do not just occur whenever he succeeds Moses. But many, many years before that, even at the age of 20, being a type of Christ Joshua was the only person allowed to join Moses at the high point of Mount Sinai during his first 40 days when he received the Ten Commandments. If you'll also recall, once that Joshua, Caleb, and the other ten spies went into Canaan and they came back and all the people were fearful of the giants within the land, but Joshua and Caleb, they stood up and said, no, we can go in, we can take this land, have faith in God. So during the time of Moses, we see Joshua entered Canaan and encouraged Israel to enter into it, by which we're told they attempted to kill them, meaning Joshua, Caleb, probably even Moses and Aaron, they attempted to kill them at that time. Now, this is very similar to what occurred in the life of Christ. In a similar way, Jesus first arrived while the law prevailed, as Joshua did while Moses was alive. As the time that we just went over, Moses was alive whenever they entered into Canaan. Whenever Joshua first entered into Canaan, just like Christ first entered into the world, the law was still very much prevalent among the Jews. And Jesus, like Joshua, he encouraged Israel to have faith in God, namely him, resulting in his crucifixion. Just like they tried to kill Joshua, so did the death of Christ actually transpire. As many of you know, Joshua and Jesus, they share the same name, having the same meaning being God is salvation. But you may be asking, well, why is it not pronounced the same? Perhaps the most well-known name in the entire world, Jesus Christ, is the name of the Messiah of the Christian faith. And that name has become pretty widespread, regardless of your personal beliefs. But there's something unusual about the name Jesus, since in the original copies of the Bible, his Hebrew name is actually written as Yeshua, which more closely aligns to the English name Joshua. So where did this translation come from?
Even though there were other men with the first name Yeshua in the Bible in the Old Testament, and also men with the same name who were contemporaries of Jesus, their names were written in Hebrew and thus stuck closer to the Joshua translation once their names were converted into English. So the men named Yeshua in the Old Testament became Joshua's, and the Yeshua of the New Testament was transliterated to Jesus. And the distinction of translation versus transliteration here is key. Translation is the act of changing a word from one language to its equivalent in another language, like book in English becoming libro in Spanish. But transliteration is the conversion of letters and sounds from one alphabet to another. For example, Greek has the letter phi, but that letter isn't a part of the alphabet in English, so it's phonetically transliterated phi. Now that the introduction is given, I'm going to give really quick fire similarities, so do try to keep up. Joshua succeeded Moses. Christ's grace succeeds the law of Moses. Joshua led Israel into the promised land. Jesus leads spiritual Israel into heaven. The Ark of the Covenant stopped the River Jordan for those following Joshua, and in the greater fashion, God stops death for those following Jesus. The Ark of the Covenant representing God, Jordan representing death, and Joshua being a type of Christ. And in case any of you are wondering how Jordan, the River Jordan, represents death, well, it does this throughout. Jordan means a descender, and it's descending into the Dead Sea. Now, the Dead Sea is one of the saltiest, nastiest, most putrid places on the planet. That's actually where Sodom and Gomorrah and all of those horrible cities were located, right around the Dead Sea. It's a, it's a representative of hell. So the imagery is this. Whenever we die, it's like we're crossing the Jordan. Death being the Jordan and the Dead Sea being hell. And all are carried down into the Dead Sea, i.e. hell, unless it's stopped by God, and we're led across the Jordan, untouched by the waters, untouched by death, by Jesus. Whenever you were water baptized, it was a showing, an outward showing of what had already happened spiritually, and that is you died to self and you rose a new person, a new creation in Christ. We're told in Joshua 3.16 how the waters of Jordan were pushed back all the way up to this city Adam. End quote. City Adam. And I really believe that right here's where the imagery really, really amplifies. Death would be stopped. I believe that this is what that signified, how death would be stopped even from the days of Adam. For all those in whom have been justified by faith since the days of Adam. Notice how once they crossed the River Jordan, Joshua was told to gather 12 stones. Well, Jesus gathered 12 disciples. If you recall how Joshua had sent spies before they ever crossed the River Jordan, how he had sent these two spies into Jericho, the city Jericho, and this would be the very first place that they would attack once that they came into Canaan. Well, this woman named Rahab the harlot, she actually aided the two spies and really saved their lives. Once they were finally able to escape the city, they told her to leave this scarlet cord, this red cord, hanging outside of her window, and her and her household and all of those in whom were with her and whom really loved the true God and whom meant no harm to Israel, how they would all be saved. Well, that scarlet cord was just like the Passover in Egypt. So would Rahab and Jericho tie a red cord to her window, foreshadowing all covered in Christ's blood would be saved during the tribulation. Now, that's a big, big hint as to what is meant by this Jericho attack. And I want for you all to keep that in mind. The symbolism involved with the Jericho battle really has everything to do with the final seven-year tribulation period leading up to Christ. And we'll see that right here in just a second. And just for an extra little note, Rahab would even be married to an Israelite a type of the Gentiles being grafted into the new covenant, she would even be an ancestor of Jesus. It's at that point that Israel, they cross the Jordan, and Joshua has the encounter with the man with the sword, the pre-incarnate Christ, and then he goes to war against Jericho. And now we start to see the symbolism. They walked around Jericho for seven days with seven priests seven times on the seventh day. There are also... 
seven seals, seven years of tribulation, seven trumpets, and seven bowls in the book of Revelation. Seven trumpets are blown at Jericho. Seven trumpets are blown in Revelation. Joshua 6 tells us how at the sound of great shouting, Jericho fell. Well, Revelation 16 tells us how at the sound of voices, every city of the whole earth falls, just like the walls of Jericho. With a shout, Israel's enemies are ruined. And also with a shout, the Antichrist is destroyed. After the battle at Jericho, a man of Judah named Achan became greedy, was cursed, and died. Well, I firmly believe that this was a type of Judas Iscariot, who was also greedy and thereby was cursed and died. It would be after the death of greedy Achan that Eyes, king, the city of Ai, which was the next city that they were going to attack after Jericho, Eyes, king, would be hanged from a tree after they defeated the city. Eyes king would be, quote-unquote, hanged from a tree just as Judas would die and the great king be crucified. We're then told about how Joshua, he leads them in wars against the Canaanites, and then we're told during this next large battle against five kings how great hailstones began to fall upon the Canaanites, and it killed more than the Israelites actually killed. And this was such a foreshadowing of these final days in Revelation 16, 21, we're also told how great hailstones fall during God's wrath. We're told that they're the size of beach balls. They're, they, they weigh about 100 pounds apiece, these hailstones. You can only imagine. It's like missiles from heaven. It would also be during those battles how Joshua would cry out for the sun to remain in the sky to give them light to fight. Well, just as cosmic miracles occurred while Joshua warred with the Canaanites, similar signs will occur during God's wrath. We're told about how the sun is struck by an angel, and then it basically begins to microwave the inhabitants of the earth, and also the sun goes dark, and all of these cosmic wonders begin to happen in the sky during God's wrath. The five Canaanite kings were then told how they run and they hide in a cave from Joshua. Does not Revelation 6 tell us how kings will hide themselves in caves from Christ? Revelation 6 verse 15, And the kings of the earth, and the great men, the rich men, the chief captains, mighty men, bondmen, free men, hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains. They'll all be hiding in these caves and bunkers. And said to the mountains and rocks, they're crying out to these mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of of the Lamb. Joshua then orders the kings to be brought out of the cave and Israel's captains to place their feet on their necks. They would then go on to execute them. But this was a foreshadowing of that in which God will do for us. Romans 16 20 tells us how the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. It would take seven years of war to conquer Canaan, bringing rest to the people, according to Joshua 14 and chapter 11. The tribulation period before Christ's return also lasts for seven years, whereby he brings rest to the earth. Joshua then goes about dividing the land between the people. Jesus will likely do the very same, appointing his followers with rulership, lands, duties, etc. upon his thousand-year reign. Joshua leads Israel's armies. Jesus leads heaven's armies. Joshua taught the words of God, according to Joshua 3.9. And Jesus is the very Word of God. Now that's it for the similarities between Joshua and the great and mighty, blessed be His name, Jesus Christ. But I also have other, a couple of other videos like this, 60-plus uh, similarities between Joseph and Jesus and 30-plus similarities between Isaac and Jesus. I also have an entire Bible study series where I go over the entire book of Joshua right up until I think the dividing of the lands and such. So if you'd all like to check that out, feel free. I thank you all for joining me. God of peace be with you.